Framtíðarbók Gjöf til framtíðar Kápi Banki Vafalítið þeir hægt að fullirða að Milton Friedman sé þekktasti hagfræðingu sem nú er uppi. Friedman var lengi kennari við háskólanni Chicago. Hann öllaðist heimsfræg þá er í 1976 er honum voru veitt Nobelsvelunin í hagfræði en þau fekk hann meðal annars fyrir rannsókni sínar á nýsluhegðun og peningamaksþróun. Ef til vill á Friedman almenna fræð sína meira þakka frjálsíki stjórnmálaskóðunum sínum en hagfræði en frjálsíki stjórnmálaskóðunum sínar hefur hann sett fram í bókum og sjónvarnstáttum en hluti sjónvarnstáttana var sýndur hér í íslenska sjónvarpinu fyrir nokkrum árum. Jafnframt því að vera frægur er Friedman og mjög umdeildur og sýnist sitt hverjum um ágæti þeirrar efnahagstefnu sem fyllt hefur verið í löndum og borð við Chile og af stjórnum Thatchers í Bredlandi og Reykans í Bandaríkjónum en Friedman og kenningar hans hafa haft veruleg áhrif á stefnu stjórnenda þessara landa. Um alla þessa þætti munum við ræða við Friedman í kvöld og umræðurnar munum fara fram á ensku. To discuss Friedman's theories, policies and field questions tonight, we have three men who have been or are university teachers. Birgir Björn Sigrjónsson at the Economics Department of the University of Stockholm, Olafur Ragnar Grimsson at the University of Iceland in the Department of Political Science and Stefan Olafsson also at the University of Iceland in uh, the Department of Sociology. The rules of the engagement are that we would like you to be as brief as possible so we can cover as much, much as possible but before we open the uh, open up for general discussion and questions I would like to ask you Professor Friedman to give us a brief outline uh, of you what you see as uh, the ideal society your personal utopia if you would like <laughs> well my personal utopia is one which takes the individual or the family if you will as a key element in society I would like to see a society in which individuals have the maximum freedom to pursue their own objectives in whichever direction they wish, so long as they don't interfere with the rights of others to do the same thing. In such a society, I believe you do need a government, but the government has a very limited role. Its role should be to provide for the national defense, to provide for protecting one individual from coercion by other individuals and finally to provide a mechanism whereby we can formulate the rules that will govern us the rules that decide what we regard as private property what we regard as the rights of individuals uh, legislative process and as part of that a mechanism for judging differences of opinion so you would have essentially in my good society a very limited government devoted to the tasks of defense, of justice, of legislating rules, and very little else. Mm -hmm. The rest would be left to the free individual activities of individuals joined together through the operation of a private and competitive market. At the moment, we, we have, uh, uh, in your opinion, I guess anyway, too big a government and uh, very far uh, from uh, the ideal society which you have described which would be the best way to attain to realize that dream there is only one effective way to do so and that is by democratic means by allowing the people to express their views i have been fascinated by the fact that in country after country you have a paradox you have what is supposed to be a government of the majority you have a representative government and yet that government repeatedly does things that a majority of the people oppose you go around in the united states for example where i know the situation best and you will find that a majority of the people in the united states think government is spending too much imposing taxes that are too high and would like to see government cut back at the same time the representatives of the people through the parliament through what we call the Congress, you call the Parliament, uh, follow policies which lead to those results that the majority deplore. The reason for that, I believe, is that we, don't, we have a defect in our governmental institutions. 
What we have is a situation in which minorities, special interest minorities, are able to exercise undue influence. In my opinion, so far as the United States is concerned, our solution to that is going to be through public action, which will lead to constitutional provisions, setting narrower limits on government. That was a device that was adopted in the 18th century by the founders of our country in the original Constitution. And we need to reinforce that, in my opinion, by using the Constitution to set narrower limits on the scope of government. Mm -hmm. If we uh, turn now to the economics theories, Peter uh, Gilbert. Well, uh, we had in mind to start this discussion with some question of pure theoretical sure. uh, kind and uh, then proceed towards more economic policy uh, questions and, and so on. Uh, I recall an article or a lecture given by Professor Hahn uh, from Cambridge at the London School of Economics where he does not agree that the quantity theorist model passes through what you would, what you might call uh, the normal requirements of a modern economic theory. Uh, this does mean that he disqualifies the modern uh, theorist stand, standpoint of, of, the, of the monetary school uh, just on the same grounds as the old quantity theory school. Uh, what is your reaction to this interpretation of, of Professor Hahn position? Well, I don't know that I can answer that in detail because I haven't read Frank Hahn's lecture that you're referring to. But the position in general reflects a split that has occurred among economic theorists for at least a century. It's a split. I wrote an article many years ago on, uh, on Walras in which I drew a distinction between Walrasian economics and Marchetian economics. The Walrasian view is that you have to have a general system of economics, general equilibrium system, which will reflect all of the interrelations in the society in one system of simultaneous equations. Uh, it's very hard to talk about it without talking about it in a fairly technical sense. It's a general equilibrium system. Uh, Hahn is in that tradition. Alfred Marshall, who was a great economist at Cambridge in the 19th century, uh, one of the most important economists who ever lived, had a very different view. His view was that economics should be an engine of analysis, that the purpose of economists is to consider problems and try to construct tools with which they can analyze concrete problems and reach conclusions about the consequences of that. Now, in order to do that, you have to simplify. You can't consider the world as a whole. You have to narrow and concentrate on one particular segment. That's what I call the Marshallian approach to economics. I personally have always regarded myself as a Marshallian and not of all reason. I think the general equilibrium system is a beautiful work of art. I think it is very valuable for students to learn it, to get a feeling about the interrelationships of things. But there is no way in which it can be used in practice to effectively to analyze specific problems. And so I have been inclined to view economics as a task of constructing an engine of analysis. From that point of view, both what you call the earlier quantity theory and the modern quantity theory, which are really the same thing. It's not really a different thing, it's a development, a further development of it. Uh, from that point of view, uh, I believe those are effective engines of analysis. They deal with a particular problem. The quantity theory is not a general theory. It doesn't tell you very much about what the price of fish is going to be. It tells you a great deal about what the price level of all things on the average will be. It tells you a great deal about what the monetary circulation will be. And I have been inclined to view the quantity theory from that point of view as an engine of analysis. And from that point of view, I believe there is no economic theory for which there is a greater amount of empirical evidence justifying and supporting its main propositions. Thank you, Bill. Yes. <clears throat> well, this was a <clears throat> very large answer or uh, 
a strong refu refutation of, of this position. It's well, no refutation. Don't misunderstand me. Well, well, I, I think I the world benefits from differences of opinion. Yes. I am delighted to have people like Frankie Hahn and other people like yes. that because they develop ideas and approaches which other people can take up in other ways. So I'm not criticizing him. I'm only saying he's choosing to concentrate in one area. I'm choosing to concentrate in another. Well, uh, should we take that to mean as that the, your theories are not necessarily right, but what, just one of many theories which goes to make, uh, make, make up the no, whole no, mind no, of ideas? A, that's a different thing. No theory is necessarily right. In the world of science, nobody can be positive. Science consists, whether it's physical science or economic science, it consists always of a, of a set of hypotheses mm -hmm. which are accepted because they seem to fit the facts to date. But and somebody may come along and find a new set of facts. Mm -hmm. And until they can be disproven. Uh, uh, the Newtonian theory is, mm -hmm. is succeeded by the Einsteinian but theory. But to take right. that uh, up to the specific example of your own theories, as yes. you were just saying, uh, the validity of, of uh, theories uh, is found in how well they will fit empirical tests. Absolutely. Uh, quite recently, uh, the Bank of England published a research by Pro <coughs> Professor Hendry yes. in England, in which he runs your most recent work on Britain and America through uh, the rigorous tests of uh, modern economic st st statistics. And he finds out that they do not fit. And uh, he says in that article that uh, your findings uh, do not stand up to credibility. Uh, have you attempted to uh, refute uh, Henry's conclusions? Because it seemed to, by what you just said before, that you would have to do that if you want to continue to claim validity for your own theories. Well, let's take that up. First of all, I don't believe you've described accurately what Henry has done. In the second place, I don't think it is correct to describe the the methods he applied as a rigorous modern, modern methods. What Henry has done is to criticize my colleague Anna Schwartz and myself for not applying in a work published in 1982 statistical techniques that he published in 1983. Now I plead guilty to that charge. Absolutely. Those techniques that he regards as the most advanced are experimental techniques that he has been producing that have not yet been subject to the criticism of other people in the field of econometrics that are very far from being accepted techniques of analysis. Indeed, there was a recent conference in Boston under the auspices of the National Bureau of Economic Research in which one of the sessions dealt with the Henry Papers. The commentators on that were severely critical of the techniques and methods he had used. Now, to go back, he did not examine the argument of our book. What he did was to say we, fought, we attacked the wrong problem, we should have attacked a different problem, and that our results are not valid for the different problem. But we weren't talking about that problem. Moreover, his paper dealt with a very small part of the book. I have always felt that a book is like a child. When my, I have a son, when he grew up, he went out of the world, he had to live his life. I wasn't going to spend my time defending every last bit of his. In the same way, when I've completed a book, I have allowed it to go out in the world. I want it to be subjected to scientific controversy. The answer to whether Henry's criticism is valid or not will not be given by me. It will be given by other econometricians who analyze his procedures, his methods, his work. So far, such analyses as I have seen of that kind suggest that he has not succeeded in his be, alternative method. He has, excuse me, in <clears throat> supplementing his paper at the Bank of England, Mr. Henry attempted to apply his methods to produce what he regarded as a superior analysis of the data. The data he used were our data. He took them from our book. That analysis has not been his subject as it happens to exactly the same criticisms as he levied against our analysis. Yeah, but but I agree with your fundamental point. If it turns out that his work demonstrates that our results are wrong, then our theory will have to be revised, of course. Mm. But he is very, very far from doing that 
as of the present moment. Gentlemen, I would like uh, to uh, remind you, uh, just for a second, if uh, to be as pre brief as, 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 as humanly possible. Yeah, I've just uh, put one on. sentence following that, and okay. that is that it seems to me a rather surprising view when you have published a very great work, uh, which is one of the cornerstones of your contributions in recent years, and then out comes, uh, comes one of the most noted econometricians in, in England today. He isn't one of the most noted no. econometricians. I beg in, your in pardon. England, in England today. Oh, in England, In yes. England today. <laughs> and then you say it is up to other people to sure. prove that he is wrong. It's no concern of yours. Of course it's a concern of mine. Hmm. But science is a cooperative enterprise in which many, many people cooperate. I have published other books. I haven't spent my lifetime trying to answer every little criticism coming from anybody on that. Mr. Hendry may well be one of the most effective econometricians in Britain, but Britain at the moment is a backwater in economics. The major econometric, uh, the major location of econometric work is not Britain, it's the United States, and Mr. Hendry is very far indeed from being one of the major econometricians in the world. Let's get things straight. So what you're in effect saying is that the criticism which has been leveled against you by Professor Hendry is really not significant enough for you to answer. I'm saying two things. Number one, it is with respect to a kind of work that is not my specialty. I am not primarily an econometrician. I am an economist. We used one set of methods and techniques in our book. That set of methods and techniques produced results which I think will hold up, have held up, have not in any way been questioned by what Mr. Hendry did. Mm -hmm. The techniques Mr. Mr. Hendry used are of an altogether different kind. He used techniques that are highly experimental, that are extraordinarily complicated mathematically. I am not competent to analyze some of that, some of the things. That's not my field of special, of specialization. And there are other people who are far more competent in that area. In the course of time, they will examine it. That's what I say. Science is a cooperative venture in which many people participate. It's not a single person. Einstein did not conduct the experiments that tested his theory. Should he have? Millikan did so because his field was experimental physics. Einstein's field was theoretical physics. <laughs> Back to economics. Uh, I, I think, think it's it very important here to, uh, to hear a comment on, on uh, the major results of, of uh, Mr. Henry and Erickson, because uh, they find out that the money demand function is not stable of the kind that you presume. That they, is not what they found out. What they found out, what they argued, was something very that's different. That's precisely what they say they found out. Yes. But, but you they, have to you interpret disagree that and, they did find out. Well, they didn't find that out at all. What they did was something else. We, let me explain the situation. We were trying to separate out the movements from cycle to cycle, the longer term trend. We deliberately tried to eliminate the intra-cycle movements. And what, what kind what of time find, frame are we talking about when you, when you talk about longer cycles? Uh, oh, we were talking, our book covers a period of over a century. Right. The individual units vary in length from about one and a half or two years to about four or five year, years. So we're talking about half cycles. Right. The basic unit, uh, you see a cycle consists of an expansion and a contraction. <clears throat> and our basic units are half cycles, either an expansion or a contraction. Mr. Henry's main criticism, main comment, this is why I say, he said we, uh, we decided to go to New York and he thinks we should have gone to Boston. Because his main criticism is that we divided the data in this way, instead of treating all the data at once and trying to get one theory that would cover both the movements within the cycles and the movements between the cycles. Uh, are you, and when are you... he asserts that we do not have a stable demand function for money, what he is saying is that his investigation, using the data continuously, not breaking it down as we did, did not, he was unable to devise, derive from that a function that would apply both within the cycles and between the cycles. And I don't regard that as a very surprising thing. I think the phenomena that occur within the cycles are of a rather different kind than those that occur from cycle to cycle. But, but right, yeah, carrying, on the, excuse me, carrying on the, 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 the discussion uh, on, on economics, I, I think we have to be very brief, uh, but you have a further point to yes, make. Yes. 
Are you then saying that you already knew it before you manipulated your data from the phase data of, uh, from, from the annual data to no. the phase data that you knew no. that the demand function and the velocity function would be in staple? No, excuse me. No, you have to first, 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 first. You, you have to, have to say. Uh, you, you, did did I hear you correctly? You said that um, Professor Friedman had manipulated the uh, data. He had transformed the annual data. Of course, to, to I manipulated data, the data yes, for his cycles. I yes. don't doubt that I manipulated the data. Every statistician manipulates the data. Okay. The fellow who okay. corrects a series, oh. I have a series of data, and you're all acquainted with correcting him for seasonal variation. You can describe that as manipulating the data to eliminate the season. So I have no, I'm not concerned about but what just to summarize what you use in one sentence. But I want, to go to, I want to go to your point. What do you mean new? We always start out any study with some tentative hypothesis. We don't really know in any field. We start out with a tentative hypothesis, and we try to see if the data we're examining fit that hypothesis or contradict it. If they contradict it, we try to develop another hypothesis which is consistent with those data. So, of course, the reason we decided to try to separate out the intracycle movement from the intercycle mo movement was because we started with a tentative hypothesis that the demand function for money would be different within cycles, that the factors that would affect the quantity of money people hold in the short term would be different from the factors that would affect what they would hold in the long term. But let me emphasize. The problem of the demand, you know, in our major book, in the book here you're talking about, there are two chapters devoted to the demand curve for, uh, function for money. There's also a chapter, to a very long chapter devoted to behavior of interest rates, which has not been involved in this at all. There's a chapter devoted to long cycles, which has not been involved in this. There's a chapter devoted to the relations between Britain and the United States, which has not been involved in this. So let me emphasize that we're talking about a very small part of a very big book. Right. Yes, I know brief, uh, brief comment, or shall we carry on well, to the political? Uh, my point was that uh, this type of transforming data from annual data to phase data was a novelty, was a new thing no. when it was done. Well, okay, it was not a regular thing. I beg and, your pardon. And, 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 and my second point is that you choose the periodization of the model on the grounds of the monetary data, or don't no. you? No. Or by some other method. No. But that is no. pretty subjective. No. Method. No, no, you're it, quite wrong. The periodization, the problem of breaking it down into the cycle, was pioneered by the National Bureau of Economic Research by Wesley Mitchell and Arthur Burns in a book that was published in the 1930s. The National Bureau, for decades, carried on a series of business cycles in various fields in which the concept of separating out the cyclical from the non cyclical was a major part of it. There are dozens of books based on that technology. The dates we used for periodizing the data were the so-called reference dates chosen by the National Bureau of Economic Research on not the basis data. of a broad series of figures. They were not dates that we chose from the monetary figures at all. Good. Right, okay. 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 Stefan, you haven't participated in the discussion uh, and no doubt that you're willing and eager to take part. Yes, Professor Friedman, I'd like to uh, take up some of the more political aspects of your theory. Uh, one of the main themes of your many books is uh, the criticism of the role of government in Western society. And uh, this comes up in uh, various uh, books, various works, in, in relation to various issues. And uh, you give many reasons for this criticism. Uh, one of the general reasons is that uh, the bigger the government is, or the public sector, um, the more inefficient will the economy be, the lower rates of economic growth and lower levels of living will follow. Uh, when today we uh, look at the empirical facts and compare societies in the Western world, uh, we find that uh, there are many exceptions to this. And uh, uh, we have cases of societies in Europe where you have a very big government governments which have taken a big share of the national income through taxes and duties and redistribute this again through the society and also where you have more government regulation of the economy. Uh, I could mention, to, to keep this concrete, mention one society in Norway, which is uh, close by here, 
In Norway, the government takes in about 50% of the national income uh, for redistribution, spends it on schools, hospitals, uh, old age pensions, and so on. Uh, in the, the United States, the government takes for similar purposes about 30%, just over 30%. Oh, more than that. Uh, more than that. Yes, just over. Uh, it's been increasing recently. Well, if you take local and state governments, it's over. It's about 35%. Yes, but uh, the, the, the state government is uh, around about the 30%. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the main issue is that this is a big difference. It's almost uh, twice the, the, the size of the public sector in Norway is, is a little less than twice that of the United States. But uh, unlike what we would expect from your uh, theory, Norway has actually done much better than the United States in economic growth rates recently. Uh, even if we take a longer period like the, the period from 1960, this would seem to fly in the face of your theory. Let me go back uh, on several points. In the first place, I would like to stress that I have written two kinds of works. I have been involved in two kinds of things. One class of work has been scientific primarily concerned with the scientific issues. Books like the monetary history of the United States, books like the monetary trends that we were just mm -hmm. talking about, book like a theory of the consumption function. Those books are not about politics. Those books do not involve any political policy. In some cases, they do involve criticism of particular government episodes. For example, in our monetary history of the United States, I think we demonstrate very greatly that the Great Depression in the United States was largely a result of bad monetary policy by the Federal Reserve. But that's not a, that's a historical observation about what actually went on. On the other hand, I have written a set of books of which Capitalism and Freedom, Free to Choose, Tyranny of the Status Quo, all of which in association with my wife, are explicitly political. So that I regard my interest in politics as an avocation, not a vocation. I am primarily an econ economic scientist, I hope, and I think you will look long and hard in any of my scientific books to find the proposition you, found, you stated. It isn't in there. There's not a single word in any of those books that deals with the question of whether a big government is good, bad, or indifferent. That subject I have dealt with in the works which I regard as sure. political. Okay, now let's turn to that. But that's a correct reading of the political uh, works. That's a correct done. reading yes. of the political works. I'm not questioning that. I'm just trying to make the distinction. Yes. Because mm -hmm. I think it's very easy for people to confuse the two and not sure. to recognize sure. that si Perhaps see, I there's should a broad science of economics, Perhaps which I should is non-political. I should explain to you. Some of your, some of your Take the monetary theory. Mm -hmm. well, I just wanted to say that some of your followers in this country deliberately try to confuse your scientific criteria with Well, they're not political. here at the moment no. to answer for themselves. <laughs> so, Let me uh, answer for me. I'll talk for yes, me. Yes. And let me point out to you that so far as my monetary theory is concerned, it has been followed in China, in communist China, <laughs> as well as in capitalist Britain or capitalist uh, Japan. The monetary theory in particular is a non-political theory. Uh, Karl Marx was a quantity theorist, so it really has no political content. On the other hand, the point you make is a valid point. I do believe that in and of itself, a large government sector is, an, is a factor which is adverse both to political freedom and economic prosperity. Now, the question of the circumstances under which a large government sector will do harm and how large it has to be to do harm depends very much on, on, on a number of considerations. One of those, a very important consideration, is the homogeneity of a society. A large government sector will do less harm in a relatively homogeneous society than it will in a heterogeneous society. Because in a homogeneous society, people tend to want more or less the same thing. Their values are much the same. And therefore, that group of people uh, are, can more readily agree on what government can do with less division from it. A second very important factor that is particularly relevant to countries like Iceland, like Norway, like Sweden, is the extent to which they are open economies, open to the rest of the world, and dependent on foreign trade. <coughs> Both Norway and Sweden have been very largely open economies, in which they have had a, a very large 
sector of international trade, as Iceland does. It's a very large international trade. And that means, with respect to that sector, government can't mess it up. There's a world market in which they operate. They are subject to international competition. It's interesting to note that in Sweden, where in the last five years or so, government has been much more involved than it was before in that sector. Sweden is having increasing economic difficulties. It's very far. There are very few people in Sweden today who would give the kind of universal approval to what's going on there that they gave 15, 20 years ago. Now you come to Norway. You left out of your description of Norway one very, very important fact. You know what that is. That's the discovery of oil. And of course, the discovery of oil in the North Sea is a bonanza which enabled... Saudi Arabia is not a democratic country. It's not a capitalist country. But it's a very rich country right now. That's Why? I, I agree because with it that. found yes. oil. That's why you went back to 1960. I went back to 1960. If you take it from 1960 on, the fact of the matter is that the level of living in the United States, the level of output in the United States, is distinctly higher than it is in uh, Norway, has been all along. It is always very much easier for people to imitate than to in innovate. It was much easier for Japan, for example, to have a much more rapid rate of growth in its early years because it started so far behind. A country which starts way behind the leading countries can have a more rapid rate of growth. You have to look at two things, not only the rate of growth, but the level of living. Well, now, and if, if you, you take, take Norway, Norway for that, Norway has an extremely high level yes, of living. Well, what was it started in 1960? When, at the start of the this point of discussion, what, where did the United States uh, have to go from in 1960, and where did Norway have to go from in 1960? That's true. Isn't that it the was point? higher at the time, but... Uh, it's still higher today. Uh, it depends on years. Like, if we take 1980, Norway was higher. GNP it depends on exchange rates. Well, I mean, it these are the standard the measures. We, we, we apply these measures yes, to all the countries in all the years, I so understand. we can draw the conclusions yeah. both ways. Yeah. And this actually proves the point that Norway has been about. But uh, I just mentioned Norway to have one example. I could have mentioned other countries. Yeah. Sweden has a better record in many senses as well. It does. Uh, uh, it does. Average levels of living and, and, and economic growth rates even slightly better. That's not, not a great well, let's deal look of at the facts. difference. Well, let's look at the facts. At the moment, as you quite rightly say, the average level of government spending in the United States is about, it's much too high in my opinion, it's about close to 35% of the GNP, over 40% of the national income. On the average in the continent of Europe, it's 50%. In the past 20 years, there have been 20 million new jobs created in the United States. Total employment has gone up by 20 million. The number of people employed on the continent of Europe today is lower than it was 20 year, 15 years ago. In the past 18 months, there have been 6 million new jobs created in the United States. On the continent of Europe, there have been zero new jobs. Unemployment today is as high as it was then or higher. So that it is pretty clear that what happens is if a country... You see, you have to ask which is a horse and which is a carriage. A wealthy country, a country that does well and performs very effectively, can afford a larger government than a country that does poorly. But as the size of the government increases, it becomes a handicap and a hindrance. And the question remains whether if Norway permits the size of its government to continue to rise, it will or will not uh, be, a, uh, be a success. I think it will not. I, I, I just want to make the point that I'm not saying that a big government is something we should ask for. I believe in, uh, it would be ideal to have a small government. But my point is that the empirical facts actually go against your theory I on this believe, issue. No, excuse well, me. You can't deny we it have because... have to look at all uh, the empirical facts. Take a case, well, take, let me give you a counter example. Here's Japan. In the 1960s, Japanese government spending as a fraction of income was roughly half of the United States. Its rate of growth was 10% a year. In the past five years, Japanese government spending has been rising rapidly relative to national income, and it's now as large as it is in the United States. And the rate of economic growth in Japan now is about 
-hmm. yeah, but Japan is also a bad but, case yeah. for you because uh, one of the things you, you have against government intervention, government regulation, uh, is that it has the same negative effects. And uh, Japan has a small uh, public sector in the sense of taxation, uh, relatively Not small. Not any longer. Uh, well, Not relatively any longer. small. But as, as regards regulation, the, the, the Japanese economy is a much more regulated economy than the United States one, but still they've done much better. Excuse a lot me. Of the, a lot of the investment uh, which... Um, uh, is, is, uh, goes into Japanese industry and research and development is channeled through public funds. In Japan. I think that's been a greatly misunderstood and misconceived. MITI, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Industry and Trade, makes great claims. If you look at the success stories in Japan, none of them have been through government. Oh, have Sony was a private entrepreneur who did not get any government encouragement whatsoever. He built up Sony. Honda I'm sure some of you drive Honda cars. Honda was not a government program. It did not get any government support. It has been a <coughs> great success. But what about the Mitsubishi the, the Mitsubishi Enterprise was a major enterprise before the government entered in. If you take the Mitsubishi Enterprises, the steel works mm -hmm. did get government assistance. They are in great troubles now because there's a great overcapacity of steel around the world. The most prominent Japanese successes it have been the ones where they've really made a dent have been in electronics, television, automobiles. In all of those cases, it's been by individual entrepreneurs without, or in some cases against, the desires of meeting. Mm -hmm. Japan well, is a fascinating case. I've spent a lot of time in Japan. And the one thing I learned about Japan is any statement you can make about Japan which is true has an opposite statement, which is equally true. If you say that the government plays a large role in business in Japan, you're right. If you say business plays a large role in government, you're right. If you say there's a large element of monopoly in Japan, you're right. If you say there's a large element of competition in Japan, you're right. For example, you know that Japan is almost the only country in the world that I know of where there are private highways conducted for profit. <laughs> the railroads well, in Japan are part government, part private. Yeah. Well, right, Professor, I think mixture. Mr. Grimson well, wants, to, wants to make a point. very first. interesting discussion because I think it illustrates uh, very well the metho mythology which you usually imply. Did employ. you say methodology or mythology? No, well, I could have said mythology because <laughs> part of it is <laughs> I feel it that. Because as you said yourself uh, before, uh, you draw a distinction between your scientific work, which some other scientists have been criticizing very heavily, although you have wanted to downplay that criticism in this discussion. And then there is another area of your work, which is sort of political theory, in which you participate in a general political debate, trying to advocate your ideas, not on a scientific basis, but on a general basis of competition between ideas. Uh, but uh, there are a few countries where the governments have uh, adhered to your recommendations and where one has uh, a real-life situation. And uh, you said at the press conference here uh, yesterday that uh, in the first years in Chile, uh, the government followed your recommendation and it got excellent results. And to many people who have heard of you as an advocate of freedom, uh, it is a surprising paradox that a country where you have a military dictatorship, where a lot of people, th even thousands of people, were imprisoned for their views and some killed, where human rights were almost completely abolished, where political parties were banned and there was no freedom of information or the press or so on, that in a such a country of this nature, your theories can be a success. Well, how do you explain the fact that in a country like China, which satisfies every one of your descriptions, mm. those particular scientific theories have also been a success. Well, I think that because there's a, some great similarity between some of the political right. system of well, China and some of the... Well, how do you explain the, the fact that in a country like Japan, yes. which it does not correspond well, well, to your description, well, the same theories well, I can have understand also been why a you success. Want to, I can understand why you want to avoid to talk a bit about Chile. But I'm let's, glad to talk yeah, about let's, Chile. Let's I'm not trying to yeah, avoid it well, at yeah, all. But let's talk about it in, in concrete terms. Of course, yeah, be us, glad let, to. Let's talk about it how it is. That, uh, 
Let's uh, talk about yeah, Chile in concrete terms. Yeah. Let's talk about the fact that my can participation I, I in my Chile... Can I, can I explain question? first what my participation well, in Chile yeah, was? Because it yes. seems to me that's highly relevant to this discussion. Mm. My participation in Chile has two parts. It has to do with the fact that the University of Chicago had a contract with the Catholic University of Chile before the period we're talking about, in which they sent students to Chicago to be trained. We sent people down there to help them in providing their education. And as a result, we trained at the University of Chicago many highly skilled economists yeah. who well, played an important well, I, I part know all that. I in know economic all that. policy. Yeah. In I the know second all that. place, in 1975, I spent exactly seven days in Chile giving a series of lectures. You will be interested to know that one of those lectures was entitled The Fragility of Freedom and dealt with precisely the threat to freedom from a centralized military government. No, but uh, you will also point. like to know that aside from those seven days which I spent in Chile at that time, I have had no connection with the Chile government. I have never been an advisor to the Chile government. I have, ne I have never but, refrained but from criticizing the, the political system in Chile. That's but, not but, the point. Professor, uh, the, I don't think that point? anybody wanted to imply that you were in any way uh, responsible I, for I, the society I was not in Chile. You were responsible uh, for people being killed. The no. point I was trying to make, but I would have made if you hadn't interrupted, uh, was that uh, uh, you claim to be the theorist of freedom. When you're asked to give an advice in this country, you gave one word freedom. Right. Uh, but, at the same time, you are on record here in this country as saying that a country which is among the most severe military dictatorship in recent years applied your economic theories uh, truthfully. And a point I want, just want to bring out, and it seems that you have now acknowledged it as being true, that your economic theories can't be applied either in, in, in a rigorous uh, dictatorship of the proletariat, like in China, or in a dicta dictatorship by generals. <laughs> Look, are you going to say that the law of gravity is different in China and in Chile than no, no. it is in, in Iceland? No. I All right, there are certain aspects of economics, as I explained before, which are scientific in character. The law, the quantity theory of money is a scientific law. The statement that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon is a scientific law and not a political law. It is like Newton's law. If any country, whether it be a dictatorship, a democracy, whatever it may be, prints too much money, you're going to have inflation. If any country, whether it be a dictatorship or a democracy, wants to reduce inflation, it must reduce the amount of money it prints. Now, those are scientific laws. They have no political content, as I was explaining to you before. You can, whatever your political views are, uh, look, I don't understand you. Are you saying that if you have certain political views, you should only use one kind of physics? No, I'm just saying that uh, there is, uh, in the presentation of your views, uh, no clear dividing line, as I think has become apparent in your replies to the previous questions. No clear dividing line between your general political theories and what you call your economic theories. There, you is not, there is not a clear box of your economic theories and not a clear box for your, your political theories. And that is why I think many of the profit-making forces, uh, the big business side, those who want to advocate less taxes or they have more money, have, if I may say so in all politeness, taken you on as a guru because they find this kind of mixture uh, very convenient for them to propagate their own political theories and give it a kind of semi-scientific gloss. I by take it you think the automobile companies have approved my opposition to import quotas from Japan. I take it you think that the steel companies have approved my writings protesting vigorously against imposing tariffs on steel. You are quite wrong about big business taking me as a guru. When I say what they believe in, yes. When I say what they don't believe in, no. Now, let me go back to your fundamental question. And let's see if we can make a little order out of it. Every political question has several elements. One element is what objectives do you want to achieve? That's a value question. That's not scientific. That's a question of values. The second question is what means do you use to achieve those objectives? Now, that's a scientific question. 
the question of whether, if you do such and such, it will have such and such effects, is a scientific question. There are no pure, in your sense, there are no pure political questions that don't involve scientific issues. The question of whether you would like to travel, let's say if you're in the United States, whether you'd like to travel to New York, Chicago, that's a value question. The question of whether, in order to travel from New to New York or Chicago, you have to take a train or an airplane, that's a scientific question. So, of course, there cannot possibly be a complete separation between scientific questions here. The physicists who worked on the atomic bomb were applying scientific methods. The decision to use the scientific bomb was a political question. But that whole issue was a mixture of political and scientific issues. What I am trying to say is that certain parts of my work have been concerned with a scientific issue of what will be the consequences of doing certain things. Now, where I get political is when I come to the question of what do you want to do those things for? What is your objective? Look, if you want to produce inflation, as a scientist, I can tell you how to do it. From a policy point of view, I'll say you're making a mistake. It's a terrible thing to do. Don't produce inflation. Can I then just ask you one question on that? I mean, what would you say about fixed exchange rates? About fixed exchange yes, rates? and their effects on inflation. I am opposed in general. As you know, I believe fixed exchange rates have, uh, have had on the whole a very bad effect. So far as inflation is concerned, with, in the case of fixed exchange rates, so long as the exchange rates are fixed, any one country which inflates tends to export part of its inflation to other countries. And the inflation tends to occur throughout the fixed exchange rate regime. If a country does not have fixed exchange rates, if it has floating exchange rates, it is possible for one country to inflate while another country keeps stable prices. It was perfectly possible in the 19, late 70s and 80s for Japan to have relatively low inflation while the United States had fairly high inflation, while Israel had much higher inflation still. So that the difference between fixed and flexible exchange rates is that under a system of floating exchange rates, each country separately can control inflation within its own boundaries. Under a system of fixed exchange rates, it's a fixed exchange so rate area. Think, you don't think inflation can be kept down by maintaining uh, fixed exchange rates? No. Uh, and not by increasing the supply of money. Excuse me. Inflation can be contained by not increasing the supply of money. Mm. If you have fixed... No, but I said by, by increasing it. You no. cannot combine... I'm sorry. No. If you have fixed exchange rates, no. you cannot also control the quantity of money. No. If you have... If you really stick no. to fixed exchange rates... No. You know, Keynes, in his famous book on monetary reform, published in 1923, <coughs> pointed out in an appendix that you could have either stable exchange rates, either control over your exchange rates, or control over your internal price level and money supply. You could not have well, both. Well, I'm very <coughs> glad you said that, because on that point, I, I agree with you completely. I'm glad and I it, have some point yeah, of I think and, it has been, and it has been one of my main criticism of the economic policies of the present government, that I think they are exactly Mr. based on these things which uh, you have just said will now not work in order to keep inflation down. Mr. Grimson, what was just in member of the opposition is trying for no, an indictment. No, no, no. Well, we we have had a great debate in this no, country no, what about will this. keep inflation down is holding down the rate of monetary growth. Mm. If you hold down the rate of monetary growth, mm. you will have relatively stable exchange yeah, rates. What, what, what has been happening in Iceland is that the rate of monetary growth is not controlled, but it is increasing all the time, while the rate of inflation is going down. I was and the exchange I'm rate is kept fixed to the US dollar. Now, what uh, Grimson is pointing out is that this policy cannot be, uh, is not the cure of inflation. Unless it, the quantity of money, rate of monetary I growth agree. is held I down. Okay. Well, on my understanding I is agree. that the rate of monetary growth has been reduced greatly. Well, you've well, been partly no, informed, no, sir. Well, well, maybe. I don't know anything about it. Let me explain. I don't know anything about the details of the Iceland situation, no, no, no. but I will say that if you want to control inflation, there is one and only one way you ultimately have to do it, and that is by controlling the rate of monetary growth. Now, what is also true... And not having fixed exchange rates. Well, if you have... It depends on what you mean by fixed exchange rates. Most countries of the world now have sort of floating exchange no, rates. This is completely fixed. Yeah. yeah. But uh, if you have fixed exchange rates, 
that will force you to hold down the rate of monetary growth. If you try both to have fixed exchange rates and to increase the monetary growth, one or the other will give. You cannot have both. I agree with you right. entirely. Okay, if we can move away from that point. Professor uh, Friedman, uh, if I could break in here. Uh, you say in your latest book, which you were written with Mrs. Friedman, Tyranny of the Status Quo, right. you, you say on page 73, I believe, something which startled me nicely, and I always like it when that happens. Uh, you say that the greatest threat to the security of the United States society is the welfare state and you say also that it's even greater than the Soviet Union with all its nuclear weapons mm -hmm. in the light of the problems that uh, your theory about the relationship between big government and uh, economic outcomes this would seem to us here in Europe where we are used to uh, very big welfare states much more advanced than the United States one, this would seem like something of an exaggeration well, maybe it, maybe it may seem like an exaggeration, but I don't believe it is. Because what I meant by that, as I think I explained in the context, was that the pressures of the welfare state make it more and more difficult to, get, to have the funds available for maintaining a strong defense. That the willingness of the public to pay taxes is limited. That the total amount that the government, that the public will tolerate in the form of taxes tends to be, have some upper limit. Just where it is is not clear. But it has an upper limit. That depends on circumstances in different countries. And that because the welfare state has a tendency to expand and expand, to call for more and more expenditures, it makes it, it tends to impose upon the part of the budget which is available for national defense. And the sense in which I said that was a great threat was that if we did not curb the welfare state, we would be unable to get the amount of resources available for defense that was necessary to meet the threat of the Soviet Union. Could I just take up another issue, slightly different, sure. uh, uh, the question of equality. Sure. Uh, you've come out against governments or anybody else trying to increase equality in the society from the distribution of income, say, that a free market system would give us. And uh, there are, again, many reasons for, for, for your point on this, and uh, but uh, they come out differently when we talk about different groups, like when we talk about the rich and the poor. In your uh, taxation policies, you recommend that we should lower the tax rate on high incomes. Mm -hmm. And your reason for that is that this will give the rich more incentive to work harder no, that is and not also, my to, also to save. That's not my reason. Excuse me, you're the attributing reason. to me the reason of somebody else. The well, reason of lowering taxes on the rich are then what? Well, it's well, not, not to give them more incentive to save, it's me. not to give them more incentive to work. The reason for reducing the tax rates at the top is to reduce the incentive to, spe to invest their savings in unproductive ways. The fact is that with those high rates, now what you do is get tax shelters, which may be the wrong place to put your funds. Mm. I don't expect the rich to work any harder because you're going to lower the tax rate, but I do expect that the work they engage in will be directed more efficiently and will produce better, greater benefits for the rest of the population. I think it's disgraceful in the United States that we should have so many thousands of able people devoting full time of their efforts to trying to help other people avoid taxes. <laughs> we have too many tax lawyers, too many tax accountants. Excuse me, Stefan, bef bef before you make your point, uh, I would like to remind you gentlemen that we uh, are presently uh, going to run out of time and therefore we have to be very brief on these uh, closing moments uh, of this discussion. Stefan. Sure. Well, this is a very important issue because you always tie the issue of equality to uh, efficiency and the incentive to work. You don't deny that. Excuse me, and, not and only the incentive to no, work. No, but uh, could I just go on? This also applies to, to uh, w your criticism of, of welfare measures, unemployment Absolutely. benefits, uh, minimal wages, and, uh, and so on. There you uh, are worried about the, the loss of incentive to work, that people actually become lazy, lose their interest in working hard, uh, trying to move on and thereby contribute to society and uh, also also uh, 
stimulate economic growth because that all ties together. So the, the conclusion of your, of your point on this is that the more forced equality we have, the less, the less uh, success, the less work you get and the less economic growth rates. Uh, if we look to Iceland, which is uh, only one empirical example I could mention, which actually disproves it. There are many others. Uh, in Iceland, we have a relatively uh, equal distribution of income and level of living, but still we're one of the hardest working nations in the world. Our average working week is amongst the highest. So this would definitely disqualify your uh, theory which ties together equality and efficiency. There's also empirical research which um, the brilliant economist Professor Lester Thurow at MIT uh, has cited in a recent paper where he shows that if you um, tax high income groups, it does not uh, lead to um, a, a lesser incentive than uh, and otherwise. In fact, it may lead them to try harder and thereby contribute more to society, which is the opposite outcome that... Briefly, uh, I said, Stefan, briefly. Yes, this is the opposite outcome that we would expect from your uh, theory. Well, you've raised a lot of different, different issues. As I emphasize, my main argument about the tax system is that I would like to have a tax system which does not distort the incentives of people with respect to how they use their labor, and with respect to how they invest their capital. It's much more the distorting effect that I'm concerned about than it is the overall incentive effect that you were talking about. With respect to the poor, there is no doubt that in the United States, the existence of the welfare system changes the incentives of the poor in ways that I regard as adverse. I don't blame the poor people for that. They are foolish not, if they don't take advantage of the program. But as you may know, I think there is an enormous difference between 90% of us saying we want to help the bottom 10% and 80% in the middle saying we're going to take money from the top 10% to give it to the bottom 10%, most of which in the way drops off in between on the 80% and doesn't get down to the bottom. But you do not I am in favor of a society. I am in favor of a society of equal opportunity. And I say that as a matter of empirical fact, such a society will, in fact, produce greater equality than a society which seeks to impose equality. Well, I was... Now, if we come to the case of Iceland, circumstances affect things. I don't know the detailed situation in Iceland, which you say may well be true. But much depends on the character of the people, on the background, on the kind of welfare measures you have. I don't know what welfare measures you have. I don't know how much distri redistribution of income you have. The question is, do you have equality? Because you have a highly homogeneous population that has lived together for a long time and that has been able to achieve a relative degree of equality. Mm. Or do you have equality because it has been imposed upon you through a welfare state. I don't know what the answer but is. But there are other equal societies. Mr. Grimm, so that's one brief you, since time is see. sort of running short. Sure. Uh, is it a correct summary of what you have been saying, that uh, your theories of equality and taxation and so on are so, or could be so conditioned by social and historical and cultural backgrounds in different societies in, in the world, that what you are recommending for America, which you know, of course, much better than we do, is not necessarily the correct medicine uh, for Iceland. I think the general principles are the same for Iceland and for the United States, just as the laws of gravity are the same for the United States. No, I'm and not for talking Iceland. about that. I'm talking about your I understand. recommendations, I'm talking like, about like, the, uh, like uh, not. I'm talking not, uh, about the political principles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The general political principles are the same. Both for Iceland and the United States, I think the political principle so. that I value highly individual freedom and individual opportunity are the same. So, the particular specific details of application, of course, have to be different in different societies, just as uh, uh, how long it'll take for an object to reach the ground depends on how high it is before so, you so drop it. So are you it. saying we here in Iceland should stop having severe control on drug consumption? We should stop having very great social help in t terms of nat natural disasters? We should uh, stop having state if education? If you tell me, if you, if you so allow forth. me to examine in detail 
the particular cases you're dealing with, I might very well come out with those conclusions. Maybe I would. With respect to the drug case, the drug control, uh, that I think you have a great deal of evidence in many different countries. And in my opinion, prohibiting drugs does far more harm than good, regardless of what your moral views are on it. I know in the United States, half the crime in our cities comes from the drug trade. And we would have a lot less crime. We tried it with prohibition and it didn't work. If you really are interested in saving the lives of people, if that's your main objective, then you obviously ought to prohibit both smoking and drinking. In the United States, smoking and drinking cause far more deaths than either, uh, than either uh, drugs or any of these other things you're talking about. Now, I am not in that's favor of That's not a moral that. stand. It's a, uh, it is a moral. No, no, well, that's a practical stand. That's a practical but stand. But my moral stand is that I believe that people should be free to commit suicide. If, if a friend of mine drinks or smokes, I think he's making a mistake. I will try to persuade him not to do it. But I don't think I have the right but you to are, force him not to do it. Right. So I am on moral grounds opposed to the uh, opposed to pro prohibition. You're However, also, I go on to say also that those to... moral grounds are reinforced by the pragmatic grounds that trying to prohibit it doesn't work. And you're also right. opposed to free... To, brief to, comment to, from yes. you, then from the other two. Yes. And and then you're person. also opposed to the free education of children. I am opposed to... Well, we have to be very careful there, because I've written extensively on that, and my views are. I am opposed in the United States to government education of children. I am opposed to having the schools run by the state. I am have been in the past and in favor of government assurance that every child, regardless of his income or his background, be able to get schooling. But that doesn't involve running the schools. Now, I've been in favor in the United States of something called a voucher system, under which parents would be free to choose what schools their children go to. And in that sense, uh, first of all, there is no free education. What do you talk about free? No, you mean nobody about, pays I'm for it? I'm talking about the child, a child of the worker yeah. having the same chance to get education he as a child the, of the rich man. He should have and the I'm, same and chance. And I'm talking we should not have the same, have that kind of system in education as we are having now here in Iceland with your lecture. That, that the worker would have to work for two days in order to get into it, whereas the big businessman can just charge it on, on his account in, in, in the company to, to, to get well, in. Because we do, not start, out. Views, we, we, those we do not start out from the same position. Of course not. No. I didn't start out from the same position you did. No, exactly. I was lucky to be born in the United States. You were lucky to be born in Iceland. We started out from different positions. But those societies that have tried to carry out the views you're now expressing, are the societies of misery, of tyranny, of slavery. The ideas you're expressing are the ideas that were expressed by the leaders of the Soviet Union. They were the ideas that were expressed That's by the wrong. leaders of China. That's they wrong. are the ideas that have been expressed uh, in every country that has sought to go down the direction you're describing has ended up with tyranny and misery. You have in those states greater inequality in practice, between the top and the bottom than you I have really, in I mean, Are you really countries. trying to tell me that the Icelandic system of the child of the worker getting the same education as the child of the rich businessman is Soviet communism? No, I am not. Or, or, no. even, or even will will lead to it? No, I am not saying that. I'm saying something different. I'm saying the principle you expressed, that there's something wrong about some people having higher incomes than others, mm. that there's something wrong about somebody you call a rich man Starting being able to... Starting out in life. Well, whether he starts out in life or not. But there's well, something that's, that's wrong. That's the essential thing. That's there is no way you can make people equal at their start. What you can do is to give them equal opportunities. You cannot in any way make the child who is born blind equal to the child who is not born blind. You can try to compensate for that, but you cannot start people out equal. And what I am saying is that the principle you're expressing, that there is something wrong with some people ending up at a higher income level than other people. I'm saying starting out with. There is no way people can start out the oh, same. Of course there is. And and there there, is can, no there can be e there e equal opportunity. I, I think oh, we've progressed yeah. as far as we can with this. Equal opportunity is what we want. We don't want, we want everybody to have the same opportunity to make and take advantage of whatever qualities he has. Some people will accidentally be born with higher qualities. Some people will be lucky in the choice of country they're born in. Some people will be lucky with the parents they get.
But who would pay the vouchers that you mentioned? Who would pay the vouchers? That's where I went back. It's one thing to have 90% of the people impose taxes on themselves to help the other 10%. So th That's in effect, people would be of paying course, them because of this would be the 90%. Yes. Right. right. It's a very different thing. And this is where the alternative, to have 80% in the middle mm -hmm. try to impose heavy taxes on these people in order to benefit themselves or the people lower down. Right. Uh, if there's a brief comment on anything we've just been discussing, uh, obviously we cannot raise new issues here, then the, the floor is yours. Well, I would just like to mention one thing in this connection. That's uh, about inflation. Sure. Uh, Professor Topin has uh, calculated or estimated the cost of the U.S. Uh, uh, lack of work now, unemployment, and uh, excess uh, process, uh, production capacity of about 500 billion of dollars. Uh, is, that, is that an overestimation? What was the cost of the unemployment caused by the inflation? Well, that was much less. Was this, it? this was the net figure, he, he stated. Uh, no, I beg your pardon. If I remember the calculation you were speaking of, it was an estimate he made some years ago of what would, in fact, be the cost, not of what it actually has been. And you must realize that in country after country, as inflation has risen, unemployment has gone up, not down. Inflation temporarily reduces unemployment. But after a period, it increases it. I, I, think, I think you're wrong, because in the countries we, we have just mentioned that is the uh, most splendid monetarist case, the United Kingdom, you have been trying to control money supply and been rather successful, and still employment is increasing. And, in, the, cost, in, and the cost of those people being unemployed is rising all the time. But if you look at the pattern... And, and then you must ask, where is the na natural level of unemployment? Will they ever reach it? Well, you must ask a different question. Is there an alternative? Is there a way, is there any country which is able to maintain a stable rate of inflation without an increase in unemployment? I think, and the I think... answer is that what happens is if you try to solve the problem by inflation, the inflation tends to get higher and higher and eventually gets out of hand. The implicit assumption in these comments is that there's some third way. But the fact is that once... Let me ask you a question. Is there a way you can cure an alcoholic that he doesn't have to go through a very difficult period? I think you're trying The to... real problem is that he became an alcoholic in the first place. And the real problem is that the country started on an inflationary route in the first place. I think you so have society's a problem. being alcoholics. Uh, Mr. Friedman, I must just point out, I think you have uh, identified the illness wrongly because the problem is not inflation. The problem is unemployment and misery. And how do you solve the unemployment problem without making a larger inflation if you take your point of view? How are you going to solve the well, unemployment problem? I think problem? that it's much easier to be how? larger inflation than unemployment. It's well, much easier to what? To beat to larger inflation than unemployment. than unemployment. Much easier to beat larger inflation to, than unemployment. To live with. To live with. Where is a country that has lived indefinitely we with have higher, higher inflation? We, well, have this a long history. we have a long history of rather high rates of inflation yeah. and, and almost let marginal me go, Let me go back for you. What I have always said is that the problem is not the level of inflation, but changes in the rate of inflation. Mm. I agree with you that it's mm. perfectly possible if you can have a 30% inflation indefinitely no. to live with it. Mm. The problem is you cannot have a 30% rate of inflation indefinitely. Mm. Iceland had a high rate of inflation, but then it tended gradually to creep up, creep up, no. creep up. No. Finally, no, 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 it got no, no. to 130%. Come down. Come down. Since last year, it was 130% a year no, ago. No, 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 it was not. Yes, I mean, Stefan, you uh, have I think the final people point. people should brief you a bit better about the facts. You, you have the final you point, Stefan. We, we, the, mat the, fact of, uh, the fact of the matter is that we had uh, long, for a very long time, we had had, had an inflation for about I know, 14 you years had or something like that. That's right. It was spiraling uh, until last year, which is quite correct. It was spiraling Since it, up it ha like has that. come down. But, uh, but is, those are the facts. Well, Stefan, you yeah. have the last word. Professor Friedman, I really enjoyed this discussion with you. I only wish I could afford to come to your talk on Saturday. Uh, unfortunately, I can't pay 1,200 kroner this time. I didn't know what they were charging. But, uh, and I just want to make it known that I don't consider that an increase in our freedom to hear interesting and provocative ideas, to, uh, to sell entries to lectures. Professor Friedman. I'm sorry. Uh, That's a very difficult question. 
I'm sorry. I don't know anything about. This is new in Iceland. That's why I'm. I'm what is new in Iceland? The thing is, the thing is, the thing is that. What can I put it? We, we, yes. Professor of the university. The University of Iceland has a half a century old tradition of public lectures by academicians and professors or scientists coming from abroad. These are free, open to everybody. Your lecture, unfortunately, is a big break with that tradition. It's the first time that the University of Iceland is a party to selling entrance at such a high price. It's higher even than if the Bolshevik ballet came to this country. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. obviously you're valued very highly. Yes. <laughs> Well, the thing I is that we are not uh, familiar with the... And the yeah. point, point my friend was making to charge that it does not increase freedom academic or otherwise it decreases it. Well, you see, first of all, I suspect that somebody was paying the expenses of those lectures. Who was paying the expenses of those free lectures? The people who didn't go to it. Now, I ask you the question. As I should make clear, I am not getting paid for that lecture. I'm not getting a fee well, for it. Then it would be very interesting to know who gets the 300,000 right, kronos. Whoever <laughs> may get it. But let me go back for my expenses. Some I think of my there expenses will be a lot of costs involved with this. There will be so a lot of costs involved. Yeah, all right, all right. Well, let me, I okay, want to um, ask you a very question. Professor Friedman has, uh, has the final word here. We, we, we are way over time as, as yet, and I don't think this is a very productive discussion which we are conducting right at the moment. So if I can admonish you and, and, and ask you to, to, to give Professor Friedman the chance to, to sum up. Uh, at the end. Well, I won't sum up. I'm going to answer just this one question because I think right. it is a very important one. I think that the word free is one of the most misused words. We speak of free education. Education isn't free, it costs money. You spoke of free lectures, but those lectures weren't free. The lectures halls had to be provided. The facilities had to be provided. I am sure you have paid fees to some of the speakers. What you mean to say is that the people who attended the lecture were subsidized by the people who did not attend the lecture. No. And I do not believe that that is in my concept no. of what a free society should be. So I think that the uh, uh, charging of fee for a lecture in order to limit the number to the size of the room, in order to make it available to those who value it most highly, is a perfectly appropriate application of the price system. And that is the point at which we conclude tonight. No doubt we could go on almost forever as long as anybody would care to, but this is the point where we stop tonight. Professor Friedman, thank you very much for being with us here. Stefan Olafsson, Birgit Björn, Sjöronsson, Olafur Ragnar Grimsson, I would like you to thank you all very much for partaking in this discussion. I hope that the viewers have had a good time, as good time as we had here. So, good night. <laughs>